Hey, everybody. Super great to be here today. Thanks so much for having me. I'm going to talk today about independent deployment for the front end, specifically when it comes to single page applications, and one way that you can achieve this using tools like Docker and Kubernetes. So before I talk about what's possible, I want to talk about where we are today. Probably you have a diagram in your office that looks something like this, or maybe you've read it in an architecture book at some point. The base of your diagram, it begins with your microservices, right? Each of these lives in a nice bounded context. They maybe own the data that you're operating on. They can be deployed and maintained independently, and you have an autonomous team that owns and operates them end to end. So far, so good. On top of that, we have maybe an API gateway that handles how you're going to access these things. And then on the very top of this you know, immaculate uh, architecture diagram is the UI layer. Uh, I like to think about it like the icing on the cake, because it's kind of like the best part. But in reality, when you look at this and you see it in, in uh, an architecture book, oftentimes you think, is that all you're going to tell me? It's just like this box at the top, and that's, that's the only details I get out of it. Um, it can feel like, you know, these days, the UI layer is becoming responsible for more and more. And yet, all we get in terms of information on how it should be organized is this one big box on the top. And a natural question that can come up is, why didn't we just naturally start to break this down like we did microservices? Who here has ever been asked by your boss, your CTO, why can't we just have microservices in the UI? Anybody? Has, have you been asked this? I think it's completely normal, right? And you're like, it doesn't work that way, <laughs> right? And there are a couple of main reasons for that. Um, the first of which being, well, cross-component communication is a bit different, right? We have different frameworks. We're not just talking with data, but we're talking also with more complex objects. Uh, we also know that visual consistency is super important for us. Maybe you, know, you see an API. You get some documentation on it, which was made by a back-end team. It's in a microservice. And it doesn't really matter that it's inconsistent. Maybe to you as a developer, you care a lot. Uh, but the user is never going to see that inconsistent API. So that's one way that these also differ. And finally, most of our build tools assume that everything that I need to build and run my app is going to be available at build time. But that's not exactly the way we want to build distributed systems, right? So all of these things impose upon us some different limitations that make them unique when compared to how microservices work in the world of backend. And as we have probably all felt a bit, if you worked in a team that starts to grow and then it keeps growing and growing some more, you're like, is this going to be sustainable to keep doing things that way that I have always been doing? It becomes challenging because you have one way to get to prod. Maybe you use some strategies like feature toggles, um, or you practice trunk-based development. But at the end, you've got one path. We also have the topic of getting buy-in from more people. The bigger the code base, the more developers, the more people you need to get on board when you want to make a change. And sometimes this can lead to stagnation, because getting enough people on board is really, really hard to do. It also creates a single point of failure. How many times has it happened that you deployed something and a totally unrelated change that you promised to QA was not going to affect anything else resulted in a totally random bug you just could not possibly foresee? And you might be thinking, tests are the answer to this. Obviously, Monica, if you had the right test pyramid all filled out with all of your tests, well, then you could just deploy all the time and you wouldn't have an issue. But we all know that having reliable tests, especially the higher you go up in the pyramid, it is very difficult to do that, and you're going to spend a lot of time maintaining them. We also have the topic of shared tools. Some people love to maintain Webpack. I don't. Um, that's OK, but, but do you really want to have people in your team and their only job is to maintain and you know, upgrade everything all the time with all these new releases that are coming out? And at the end, things just get slower. You have more people, more communication, and things start to slow down. And the reality is we're working against Conway's law. As you probably know, if you've heard of this, this term before, when you design a system, you're very likely to copy the way that your teams and communication structures are set up in your company. But here we are having this cross-functional teams that are meant to own something end-to-end, -end, but that vertical slice of ownership 
ends at the front end, right? And then they need to go into the UI layer to communicate with all these people and get the job done. So how do other people solve this problem? It's the buzzword of, I don't know, the last couple of years, micro front ends, right? It sounds very sexy. You're like, it's micro, like microservices, but for the front end, and your boss loves it, right? Because they're like, finally, you're listening to me. Um, and yeah, it's, uh, it promises us that we can decompose the UI into blocks we can deploy individually. Sounds like the panacea to all of our problems. Well, as you may know, if you have ever watched a talk about micro front ends, I'm guessing a lot of you have, there are so many different approaches. No two companies do it the same. And sometimes it can be hard to find out is there a standard or best practice or anything like that? Um, and the main question, the main thing that distinguishes between them is where does integration happen? Um, and which point of integration makes sense for you is going to depend a lot on the requirements that you have. So you can do this from links. You have one app. It links to another app through a hyperlink. That's micro front ends for some people. That's very nice. It's probably the technically simplest way you can get away with it. You also have build-time integration. This is common in a monorepo. So I have all my nice packages, but when I build, it all comes together because that's how my tools are organized. And then I deploy everything to production. Is this, this micro-frontend? Maybe. Up to you to decide. You also have server-side integration, so the server is responsible for bringing together all of the artifacts. And you have client-side integration. So I click something, I request something, I put it in the DOM, more or less. All of these different kinds of approaches have their own benefits and their own drawbacks. I don't have time to go into all of them, and maybe you'll learn more about that tomorrow. But the fact of the matter is, when I researched a lot of these things, I felt like they really neglected a lot of the things that we believe in front end are kind of important, right? We want our bundle sizes to be reasonably small. We want a good user experience so people don't need to reload the page when they navigate. We want that the developer's experience is really great because we are so spoiled in the front end for amazing tools. And when something doesn't work just the way we want it to, we're going to complain on Twitter. Um, what about microservices? I mean, one of the things that I found a lot when I looked at these solutions is we kind of took the micro from microservices, and we thought that was enough. Um, but in reality, there are so many best practices and great ways you can shoot yourself in the foot by just breaking up your app willy-nilly. Um, for example, development and production parity. So many of these options just say, I develop my thing. I'll see how it looks once I deploy it. I don't really have a reasonable way to run it on my local machine. And deploying independently, maybe they're in different packages, but they're going to get together at build time. And we still tend to centralize a lot of these things. So this made me sad, um, because my boss asked me, Monica, can't we have microservices for the front end? And I said, I'll try. Uh, so um, in, in the meantime, I found all of these things, and I was not super happy with them. So meanwhile, at my company, we started to introduce a suite of new tools. Um, the first one that we began to introduce is Docker. How many people here are running Docker in production? OK, so this is like actually more than I expected, to be honest, uh, which is pretty cool. So this talk is even applicable for you in your personal life. Um, so Docker allows you to bundle together your application in a way you can distribute it. And what's neat about this is that as developers, we can write our Docker file, we can ship it, um, we can actually have control over the image, the things that are installed on it, and so on. That's pretty neat. Then on top of this, we have Kubernetes. And Kubernetes is one of these things that is infamous for being hard to explain. It's built as container orchestration. Um, what this basically means is I have containers, and I need to control them somehow. They need to talk to each other. They need to replicate. I need more copies. Uh, maybe one of them goes down, and I need to bring them back up again. And Kubernetes takes care of that for us. And one thing that is super cool about Kubernetes is that you can define your infrastructure in YAML. So it's actually in data. So it's lower on the ladder of abstraction than if you were to program all of it and not write any tests for it. So that's kind of cool. And then kind of coupled with Kubernetes, we have Helm. And Helm gives us 
uh, a lot of capabilities, but one of the most important ones is that we can take a lot of the repetitive bits out of our manifest, and we can put them into variables that we can later interpolate depending on if we're in dev, we're in production, or some other environment. And I should mention both, both uh, Kubernetes and Helm can do so much more than we need here. But something that I think is so cool about this is that you only need certain parts of each of these things to achieve what we want to achieve. So you don't need to know like the deep depths of Kubernetes uh, in order to accomplish something meaningful. So looking at this and spending some time really learning this, I thought, can this help me? Is there some way that the things being introduced by Docker, Kubernetes, and Helm could solve some of the things I didn't really like about the micro front ends approaches that I had seen so far. So looking at the basic anatomy of a web app, I mean, I'm sure a lot of you guys are working on web apps that probably kind of look like this. Uh, so you have your side navigation, and you have the main stuff, right? It's like pretty standard. Um, and I was thinking to myself, why can't I just take this, this uh, part on the outside, the host application, it's going to be deployed the way that it would be absolutely anyways, uh, running inside of our Kubernetes cluster. But I can take out a part in the middle, whether it's one page or another page, and I can make this independently deployable. I don't necessarily need to deploy my entire app together, because this, this fragment is a component. It needs some data, but more or less, it operates on its own. So, how does this actually work? Um, there's a concept in Kubernetes called ingress, and ingress basically allows you to route traffic that is coming from the outside internet, and given a host name and a path, you can direct this traffic to a service that is living inside of your cluster. So I was like, okay, I just bring up a service for each of these parts of my application, and let's see if it works. So I want to show you guys actually how this works in code, um, go a little bit deeper. We're going to start by looking actually at what the app does, what kind of communication is possible. Um, we're going to look at that in the browser. Then we're also going to look at what does it look like to bring in a component um, from somewhere else, from, from another server. Then we're going to look very briefly at the configuration. Uh, there is a lot of YAML, you can see. There's, there's a lot of data here. Um, but we're going to see what, what interesting bits we can find. And if the internet works, we're going to do a deployment. So. Let's, let's give this a shot. Um, so first things first, let's come over to our uh, web interface. So here you can see I have two boxes. So I have my host application here, and I have my fragment application here. Okay, these things are both coming from different services that are running inside of my Kubernetes cluster. What's neat about this is that from the user standpoint, it's completely normal. I'm able to send data inside of my little fragment, and I'm able to do the same from inside my fragment to the outside. So I have bi-directional communication. I want to do things like styling. So I'm able to do this. Here I'm using CSS and JS, but you can also ship separate assets if that's something that you want to do. How does this actually work? Well, when I go to a specific route, I'm going to get some information. I know this is so tiny. Does it get bigger? It does. Um, I'm here. Yeah. So, so I'm here in, my, in the, the route that is going to my service. And this gives me information about the bundle I need and the name of the component. And I can just load that JavaScript. Cool. What does this look like now in code? So. Here you can see that I have two totally separate uh, repositories. If I go into one of them, uh, you can see I have everything I think I should have here. I have my dist, I have my node modules, et cetera. And when I actually open up uh, my two separate files, well, the first thing that you'll notice is I'm actually using a helper called async component, which is going to create a component for me. And what's neat about this is, yeah, I'm going to be loading everything. Whoops, I'm going to be loading everything remotely, but ultimately, this component operates the same way as literally any React component would. I have my fragment. I'm able to pass it in data. I'm able to pass in callbacks. 
exactly what you would expect. So from the developer experience standpoint, it's actually not so different than working on a normal React app, despite the fact that all of my tasks and everything is running in a local cluster on my machine, um, and this is actually inside of Docker at the moment. Um, and the way I get it in is by using um, mounting the, the disk directory into the container. Cool. So what happens when I want to make a change? So I want to change this message from hello, beautiful people, to hello, JS Congress. Okay. I want to write this, um, and I want to see how this actually works. So you see it made this update, and even though I'm running inside of Docker, the change is instant. It's exactly the same as you would expect. Nice. So let's actually um, let's change this, um, and let's deploy it. So I want to actually add, whoops, add this. And oh, well, that's fine. I can do this. Hello. The best commit message you've ever seen. Um, promoting good, good practices in public, as is my sacred duty. Um, nice. So we're going to push this, and we're going to come back to this in like, two, in, in like two minutes once the deployment has happened. In the meantime, let's go back uh, to, to the talk itself. Great. So right now what's happening is this is going to run inside of CircleCI. It's going to bring up a new pod um, that contains my code. What are some of the wins that we get simply by having this set up? The first thing is that we end up with better technical autonomy for our teams. Imagine you're in a team, and you have the opportunity to define for yourself what, what kind of machine am I running on. Maybe I don't want to use Node. Maybe I just want to use Nginx, but I get to choose. Um, you also have the fact that you, as a team, uh, get to own a fully vertical part of your stack. So you own not only the microservices, you own the tooling, you own what's happening in the front end, and you actually get to own this slice as opposed to needing to go there and kind of like barter with all of the developers over what gets deployed next. You deploy one thing at a time, like really one thing. Um, not one massive thing, but one, one part. And a major win for this is that you have the option to have more granular and safer releases. So instead of rolling out your whole app at once and maybe doing that gradually, you can roll out individual parts. And if you're working in a business scenario where being up all the time is super important, like in my scenario, I'm working in finance, it is so important that things don't go down. So being able to make them smaller and less risky is very, very critical. You also don't necessarily need to run the whole app. Right? So we all know things like Webpack, things like Jest, they get slower the bigger your app gets. So what this allows you to do is break out part of that and run and operate on a smaller piece. And finally, you don't have to take your whole app and do this. You can take just the parts that are interesting or relevant for you, the places you might maybe want more safety or more autonomy. You can take a page, a section, an individual component, whatever level of granularity is appropriate for your scenario. All right, now we get to the danger zone. Um, I think this is something that is really easy to have happen if you apply all of the front end best practices you're familiar with, and you just take them and you say, I'm going to keep doing that, but then I'm going to deploy this bit separately. You know, you kind of don't, don't get to have both parts. So there are just a couple of small points I want to make um, that will help you kind of change your, your mindset a little bit in terms of the architecture you need for a setup like this. The first thing is that central configuration is something we want to avoid when it's feasible. In my example, we are using a router that is still in the host application. But as this grows and scales, there's a good chance that we would want to take this out and deploy it separately. Then we want to also separate code that changes at a different cadence. If you have one team in the code base in some area that is moving really fast, super experimental, and you have another team that is maybe more cautious because their code is much more sensitive if something goes wrong, there's a good chance that you want to separate these things, because otherwise you will have either technical conflicts or team conflicts. And finally, when it comes to having consistent UI, if this is something that is important to you, I would suggest to invest in either building a design system or using something that already exists and not relying on custom CSS, because this is just the path to disaster. Um, all right. So 
At this point in the talk, I want to answer a question that is probably on the mind of at least 50% of the people in this room, if not more. And that is this one. Is this totally over-engineered? So the first time that I ever explained this concept to another developer, he's working at a different company with quite a different uh, setup and different size, he told me, it sounds like dropping bombs on ants. And I was like, OK, I can relate to that. I can understand how you feel. Um, and there are a couple of things I think you should just keep in mind when you're evaluating whether you want to break down your, your large application. The first thing is that your solution is so contextual. There are so many talks that are going to be happening over the next rest of the conference. And there are different solutions for different companies with different team setups. Everything is unique. So whether this is the right approach for you depends on so many factors. You don't need to think, you know, because I'm watching this talk, because I'm up here on stage, that this is exactly the right solution for me. It depends a lot on context. The other thing is that the tools are not the end game. So Docker and Kubernetes are very cool uh, and definitely something I would encourage you to look into. But let's be honest, maybe they're not even going to be here in five years. Maybe we're going to have something way better by then. I hope so. I mean, that's the point of technology, right? We keep advancing. And if we just get married to the idea of using these tools, we're missing out on the benefits, which is that we can architect our application differently so that it's more modular and more resilient to change in different areas. And finally, as I said, it's not all or nothing. Maybe look for some opportunities in your app and say, hey, would this benefit from more safety or more granularity or more autonomy? So let's have a quick look back at our deployment internet, please. If anybody is on the speaker internet, like, please stop that. Oh, it worked. That was surprising. OK, <laughs> fabulous. OK, so our message has updated. OK. And if I run kubectl get pods, this is uh, the command that is going to get the pod. Pod is what wraps a container uh, in Kubernetes. You can see that my host application has been running for 11 days, but my individual fragment has been running for only three minutes. So you can see I was able to deploy that part of the application totally separately from the main app. Nice. Cool. So I just want to come to the last point here, the last thing that I really want you to take away from this talk. It's not that I think that micro front ends, whether it's this solution or any other solution, is absolutely the right choice for everybody. As I said, there is context. There is the way your team is working. There are so many different things. It's also not that you should drop everything and learn Docker and Kubernetes, because those are cool technologies, but maybe they won't be around forever. Uh, it's more important instead that I think we, as developers who are working on the front end, be open to learning tools from different areas that aren't necessarily created by our own community. And I want to encourage you guys just to be open-minded and to go out sort of your comfort zone in order to really grasp what possibilities are there for what I want to build. So many times when it comes to operations, deployment, we say, it's ops problem. Um, and by giving this away to them, the reality is, is that we miss out on a lot of chances to optimize things and to understand what kind of capabilities could be in our hands if we just decided to learn the basics of these tools that maybe not every front end developer is so interested in. But I hope why you are listening to this talk is because you are different. You're interested in these tools. And I would encourage you, it's totally attainable. You can do it. And thank you. <laughs> OK. One last thing. Um, I have some resources here. Just if you are curious, I'll also post the sample code up on GitHub later. And if you're interested in this topic, do attend tomorrow's talks. There's going to be a talk on micro apps, and there's going to be a talk about Docker, Kubernetes, and Node, which are going to go way deeper into those topics. So do check them out. Oh.